Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of George Trepow? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. George James Trepow was born in 1949. Apparently, Trepow is how he pronounced his last name. It seems a little unusual to some people, like he's friends with a tree, like a Trepow, but this is what I found out. This was the pronunciation. His father was a police officer in New York City. In 1972, George earned a degree in psychology from the University of South Carolina, but he also studied chemistry when he was there. In 1975, he was arrested after operating a methamphetamine lab and selling the drug. He served two and a half years in federal prison. At some point, George married a woman named Diana Carr, and the couple moved to a rural community in Alturas, Florida. She was an orthopedic surgeon. George was pretty good with computers, but he didn't have a traditional job or steady income. His wife supported them financially. Both George and Diana were members of Mensa. This is an organization that requires a person document their IQ score is at the 98th percentile or higher. That is the only criterion for admission. It is referred to as the High IQ Society. The couple was active in a Mensa activity called Murder Mystery Weekends. They would host invitation-only parties where they would stage a fake homicide and reveal clues so that guests could try to solve the murder. George considered himself to be an expert on police procedure and crime scene management. In 1988, George and Diana started having difficulties with their neighbors. A newly married couple named Peggy and Pi Carr. Diana's last name is also Carr, and it is spelled the same way, C-A-R-R. -R. This is just a coincidence. Evidently, Diana was not related to Peggy and Pi. The Cars raised four children from previous marriages and one grandchild, so they had a busy house. There was always a lot of commotion and a lot of noise. In March of 1988, Pi Carr attempted to convert his garage into an apartment. George reported him to the zoning board, which led to a lot of expenses and delays in the construction project. In June, an anonymous letter postmarked in Bartow, Florida, was delivered to Pi Carr's house. It read, quote, You and all your so-called family have two weeks to move out of Florida forever, or else you all die. This is no joke, unquote. It was actually typewritten on a post-it note. What I find interesting about this letter is that it used the phrase so-called family, like the person who was threatening Pi did not want to concede that his family was real. Peggy Carr was concerned about the letter, so much so that she warned her children to be on the lookout. Pi was not as impressed. He dismissed the letter as a prank carried out by teenagers. In October of that same year, Diana confronted Peggy's sons for playing their radios at an unacceptably high volume. Peggy defended her sons to Diana. There was a bit of an argument. Diana angrily walked away from the area and yelled, You won't get away with this. Even though Peggy had been alarmed by the anonymous letter, she did not give a second thought to Diana's temper tantrum. Later that same month, Peggy was at her restaurant job when she started to have pains in her chest and legs, as well as numbness in her hands. She believed she was having a heart attack, but she went home instead of going to the hospital immediately. After arriving home, the pain only became worse, so Peggy's husband drove her to Bartow Memorial Hospital. Peggy said that she felt as though she was on fire. The physicians in the emergency room did not know what to make of Peggy's presentation. They kept her there for three days, even though they suspected she was having psychosomatic symptoms. Peggy's condition improved, and she was released from the hospital. As all this was going on, two of the car's sons, Dwayne and Travis, started complaining about a number of symptoms like stomach distress, burning sensations, and tingling and their fingers. A few days after being released from the hospital, Peggy's symptoms had returned. She was transported to Winter Haven Hospital. 
The physicians there did not think the symptoms were psychosomatic. They believed that Peggy had been poisoned, possibly by thallium. Peggy's urine was tested, and a very high concentration of the chemical was identified over 20,000 times, which should have been there. Dwayne and Travis were tested as well. They also had high levels of the chemical in their systems. Thallium is an element which was discovered in 1861. It was used to treat a number of illnesses, including dysentery, gout, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Eventually, a fatal side effect of the chemical started to become problematic. It would cause nerves and muscles to shrink and die. By the 1960s, the role of the chemical had changed. It was primarily relegated to being a pesticide. In 1972, its use was banned in the United States. Picar was advised that the dangerous chemical had been found in his wife and sons. He did not believe it was the result of poisoning. He said he didn't think anyone disliked the family enough to do that. The physicians notified the police. By this time, Peggy had slipped into a coma. The police, of course, thought that Pi was the best suspect. After all, he was the husband and had downplayed the possibility of foul play. In addition, they found that his marriage had been unstable. Further testing found elevated levels of thallium in Pi Carr, as well as his daughter and granddaughter who also lived in the house. The levels were not considered lethal. The police wondered if Pi was willing to poison himself in order to harm his wife. They didn't believe this was likely. As the investigation continued, the source of the thallium was identified. It was found in the bottom of four of five empty Coca-Cola bottles in the car's kitchen. The four bottles came from an eight-pack. Three full bottles were also found and sent for testing. They also contained the chemical, and it was clear that the bottle caps had been tampered with, like somebody had taken the caps off and then tried to put them back on. Because the police were now not as focused on Pi Car, they asked the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit in Virginia to generate a profile of the perpetrator. The profile specified a white male in his mid-30s who was intelligent and preferred to resolve conflicts without direct confrontation. The man would have made a number of threats toward the targets and would take pleasure in watching them die from afar. More so than the threatening letter, this profile needs a disclaimer, this is no joke. These FBI profiles are so obvious and uninspired, I think they lead to more harm than good. The police interviewed a number of people who had contact with the Carr family. When they interviewed George Trepow, he mentioned that he thought somebody wanted the family to move out of the neighborhood. He was the only one who mentioned that the Carr family might be getting pressure to do that. The police believe this may have connected George to the anonymous threatening letter. The police started to focus on George as a suspect. They searched his trash at both his house and his place of work, but had no success with proving George was involved. On March 3, 1989, Peggy Carr died. The case was upgraded to homicide. The next month, an undercover officer named Susan Gorick wrote to George and requested an invitation to one of those Mensa murder mystery weekends. George agreed, and Susan met him at one of those events in mid-April. George liked Susan, and the two started spending time together. Susan noticed a few items of interest as she spent time with George. For example, he had an Agatha Christie novel on a table that featured a killer who used thallium. He suggested to Susan that she blackmail her husband to get a favorable divorce settlement, and he talked about how she could send poison flowers. These items were not really enough to get a search warrant. The investigation was going nowhere. In November of 1989, Susan believed that her luck had changed. George told her that he and Diana were moving to Sebring, Florida, and they're going to rent their house in Alturas. Susan asked if she could rent the house, and George agreed. This gave the police the ability to search the residence, which they did. Eventually, lab technicians reported that they had found traces of thallium from a small brown bottle which was found in George's garage. George was arrested in April of 1990 and charged with 15 crimes, one count of first-degree murder, six counts of attempted first-degree murder, seven counts of poisoning food or water, and one count of tampering with a consumer product. 
George's residence in Sebring was searched. The police found a few books on poison, as well as a number of BDSM-related items, including a soundproof, windowless secret room. George was found guilty of all charges on February 5, 1991. The next month, he was sentenced to death. At the time making this video, George remains on death row. In 2018, his wife Diana Carr died after a stroke. She was 69 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Was George Trepow really guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea of guilt, starting with the inculpatory factors. George had spent time in prison for producing methamphetamine. Thallium is a byproduct of methamphetamine production. Books on chemistry and poisons, as well as a hand-assembled journal on poisons, were found in his residence. George's fingerprints were on the journal. His wife's fingerprints were not found on it. One of the poisons referenced was thallium. Among the items was a document which contained information on how poisons are detected during an autopsy. A number of chemicals and chemistry-related glassware and equipment were also found. Some of those chemicals were rare and toxic. A bottle capping machine was seen in George's garage when he first moved to Alturas. George and the Carr family had a history of conflict. There had been about 10 to 12 disagreements. Some of them were about loud music being played at the Carr residence. One of these music-related disagreements occurred a few days before Peggy became ill. The anonymous threatening letter that was mailed to the Carr family was postmarked in Bartow, Florida, and correctly indicated the address of the house as being in Bartow, even though the house was actually located in Alturas. George would have been aware of this anomaly. His house also had a Bartow address. A small brown bottle containing thallium was found in a workbench drawer inside of George's garage. George told the police he didn't know anything about thallium and said that he usually went with Diana to her workplace in the day, which was not true. George stayed at home and could have easily accessed the Carr family residence. Apparently, members of the Carr family rarely lock their doors. Moving to the exculpatory items. George's wife, Diana Carr, had also studied chemistry in school. She had access to all the same equipment and resources as George. Diana was the one who initiated most of the arguments with the Carr family, not George. Diana had the same motive, means, and opportunity as George. Pi Carr was also considered a suspect by the police. His marriage was in trouble, an affair may have been involved. George was exceptionally intelligent and understood police procedure pretty well. Why would he leave the bottle containing thallium in the garage at his residence? He had many opportunities to throw it away without detection. Also, the garage was unlocked. Anybody could have planted the bottle. There were no witnesses to the murder, no video, and no physical evidence tying George to the crime other than that bottle of thallium. When considering the evidence, do I think George was guilty? I think he was guilty in reality, but his wife was a good alternate suspect. She could have sent the anonymous letter. She could have poisoned the Carr family. This creates reasonable doubt. So I think he was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Here's what I think happened in this case. This is just a theory, my opinion. The Carr family behaved poorly. They played loud music, drove four-wheelers across George's property, allowed dogs to bark out of control. When George or Diana would approach the Carr family, they would resist to making any changes. They were cantankerous and argumentative. George and Diana became infuriated. They decided to poison the Carr family. They entered into a conspiracy to commit murder. At the very least, Diana had to know that George was responsible for the poisoning. With her background in chemistry, she must have known that the Carr family being poisoned and her husband being an expert in poison was not a coincidence. George and Diana were very intelligent and interested in murder mysteries. Maybe their whole plan of getting away with the crime was based on the idea that either one of them could have been guilty, but there was no way to know which one. At George's trial, the fact that Diana could have been guilty was actually brought up by the defense. But interestingly, George did not want this to happen. His defense attorneys simply did it over his objections. George was narcissistic. He believed that he had carried out the perfect murder. 
He gained pleasure from sadistic activity. He enjoyed how the Carr family was suffering. He did not truly understand that he was a suspect, or if he did, he did not realize how far the police would go to catch him. He didn't even bother hiding the bottle of thallium. That one mistake would be his undoing. Without that bottle, there never would have been a case. George Trepow was able to perpetrate his crime due to intelligence consistent with membership in the high IQ society, but he was caught due to arrogance consistent with the high narcissism society. Those are my thoughts on the case of George Trepow. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.